All right. Well, church, um, it's lovely to see you. Uh, again, happy Mother's Day. Uh, when we celebrate Mother's Day here uh, in Ryde and in the city, uh, we just take it as an opportunity to actually bless all the women in the church. So give me a wave. You're a woman in the house today. <laughs> <Is that? laughs> all right. God bless you so much. Uh, look, just to affirm, you are so loved by God. You are so treasured in His sight. Uh, and today we just want to say, God bless you so much. Uh, may He pour out His favor and His kindness. May He continue to reveal His promise. Uh, and regardless of all the expectations that might be on you, however old you are, however young you are, uh, because of the different roles in your life, uh, today, may there be just that encouragement to know that all those things aside, you are so loved by God. And so maybe why don't we take a moment and just pray for all the mums and the women in the house today and maybe those of you who are joining online. Jesus, we just want to lift up to you all of the women in church today, uh, no matter how old they are, the younger ones, all the way to the oldest ones, we lift up to you all the mums, um, whether they are physical mums, whether they're spiritual mums, whether mums of young kids or youngs of adult children, or maybe those that maybe had hoped to be mums, but for whatever reason, that hasn't happened. We just want to lift up to you each one today and pray your blessing upon them, Lord God. May each one know, Lord, that uh, you hem them in, in front and behind with your love, May each one know that you watch over them when they get up in the morning, when they go to bed at night, when they go out from the house, when they come back home. Lord, even before a word is on their lips, Lord God, you know what's on their heart because you love them. And each one is of great value to you. So Lord, may you just cover each one right now with an extra measure of your love. Your word says that you fill our hearts with your love by the Holy Spirit. We pray that there'll be a fresh filling of each heart with your love today. Lord, all the burdens that each one might be carrying, the heaviness or maybe even uh, the, the weight of expectation, whether that's uh, from ourselves or whether from others around them, Lord, we just pray right now that there'll be a lifting of those weights so that it, each one may know that they are fully and completely loved by you and walk in the, the joy of that. So bless each one, Lord God, and help us as a church continue to value the women in the church in a way that just honors you, Jesus, and uh, honors them as well. In your amazing name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen, amen. So thank you, ladies, just for being who you are. All right, well, there's a few things just to mention as well um, that are happening in the church. And uh, that is, we do want to thank God uh, for Ben. Uh, those of you who may know Alan and Susan, um, one of their sons, Ben, uh, recently had a triple bypass operation. Uh, but since then, he's been running up the stairs and, you know, just full of beans. So can we give God a cup of praise for that? We're thankful for that. Some of us have been praying for that, and we're going to pray for his continual healing. Some of us have been praying for Jason in the city. Uh, he has quite significant cancer, uh, only just got married last year. We were heartbroken when we heard the news, but we've been praying for him. And the news from the scans are that most of his tumors have dramatically decreased in size. So again, can we give God praise for that? That's awesome, right? How good is God? I do want to lift up to your prayer point. Got a message from uh, Candace, Tim and Candace. Many of you know, baby Ella has uh, just a serious outbreak of eczema. And so we just want to encourage everyone in the church to be praying for her healing for that. I understand uh, there's a few in our church that have eczema as well. We want to pray for healing and pray that God would just touch her body. Uh, so if you can remember her, that'd be awesome. Last thing I want to mention, just in the family. Uh, so Peter... And uh, Christine Tio, some of you may know them, uh, they recently welcomed baby Audrey into the world. So uh, if you know Peter and Christine, send them a message, walk, uh, congratulate them. So that's, that's an absolute joy. Yep. Okay, all right. Oh, here we go. You've got your Bibles. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read some scripture and then come into the Word today. Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to be starting from verse 1. And it says this, I'm reading from the New International Version. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. 
Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? And we're going to skim down a little bit further uh, to uh, verse 19. So if you go down to verse 19 of Galatians 5, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, this is the this is the cool bit. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Amen. So church, this year, we are focusing on this transformation, this journey of being Spirit-led. And I'm going to show you a picture right now. Uh, this picture of what you're going to see coming up is a picture of what God wants to do in your life and in my life. This is it. He wants to cause His fruit to just be absolutely teeming from your life and my life. Absolutely overflowing the fruit of the Spirit so that it will just ooze out of the garden of your life and just bless the people around you. And as that happens, it's going to bless God. Because when God sees the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, it goes on, as He sees that fruit growing in your life and my life, what it's going to do is it's going to reveal the character of who God is. He's going to see that fruit growing in your life and He's going to be Welling up with gladness and joy. These are my sons and daughters reflecting the qualities that, that reflect who I am. It's going to bless you. Because as this fruit grows in your life, that sense of abundance and that sense of joy, living life with the fruit of the Spirit is a life of abundance. Amen? When we start walking with that love of God, that, that joy, that peace, that patience and that self-control overflowing in our lives, it's going to make the journey of living life on earth so much more full, no matter what it is that we face. It's going to start blessing the people around you. Other people are going to see that fruit and they're going to say, I want to hang out with Steve more. I want to hang out with Mark more. I don't know what it is, you know, about Raymond and Cynthia, but I just need to hang out with them. When I'm with them, I'm experiencing something that I'm not experiencing elsewhere, and I want some of that. It's going to bless them. When our neighbors started growing a passion fruit vine on their side of the fence, guess who benefited, <laughs> right? And, and we, we didn't complain. We're like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, and some, some of the friends that would come over, they also said thank you, you know, because can I have some? You know, plastic bags later. It was awesome, right? So, so this is the beauty of how God, when He causes the fruit of God, to, the fruit of the Spirit to grow in our lives, it impacts Him, it impacts us, it impacts the people around us, it blesses people. And when they see that and we say, you know what, this fruit, it's not me, it's Jesus. It's His Spirit in me that's doing this. Then that brings great glory to God. Because the revelation of that inward transformation glorifies Him. Now, here's the challenge. Why is it that we don't experience this all the time? 
And I'm not here to say, yeah, I, oh man, I have fruit all the time, right? Why is it that sometimes it feels like this? Anyone had this experience before? Yep. Sometimes in our life, it feels more like desert land, feels more like dryness than it does this abundant fruit. Now, there's many reasons why sometimes life feels like this. And sometimes it's completely outside of our control, no matter what it is that we're doing. But I want to share with you one reason why sometimes it feels like desert and not abundant fruit. And one of the reasons is because, I hope this has full effect, yes, <laughs> legalism. And today I want to talk about that, about legalism, what it is, why it's so dangerous, and what the alternative is for you and for me. Praise God there's an alternative, right? And as we deal with this, hopefully this can be a way in which we can continue to step in to the abundance of the fruit that God has for us. Now, the best definition that I could find on this, which I thought was really simple, was legalism is any attempt to gain acceptance or forgiveness from God through our own works or merits. Now, in other words, if, if I can do the right things, if I can uh, uh, pray the, the right things, if I can read enough of God's Word, if, if I can do all the right kind of spiritual activities, uh, and no matter what religion, if I, if I can do the right things, then somehow I'll gain the forgiveness or the acceptance of God. Now, here's the thing. You'll see this in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 2.16, it says, A person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Because by the works of the law, no one can be justified. And what does this mean? See, the Galatian church, they were going really well. They heard about Jesus. They heard about the good news that he died on the cross, take away their sin, that he was raised to life, and that he's given the Spirit. And, and the Galatian church were walking in that um, freedom. They were walking the joy of being saved. The Holy Spirit was doing miracles amongst them. It was going great. And all of a sudden, these people came from uh, the, the Jerusalem church. These people came that were Jewish Christians and as they engaged with the Galatian church, they said, you know what? If you uh, really want to become a true Christian, if you really want to be accepted by God, it's not enough for you to be able to just have faith in Jesus. You're going to have to also follow the whole of the Jewish law. You're going to have to get circumcised. I'm telling you now, if I was one of the guys back then, well, what? I didn't sign up for that when I said the Sinner's Prayer. All right, so you've got to be circumcised, and you're going to have to follow the whole of the Jewish law. The ceremonial laws, the moral laws. And in case you're wondering, there's about 613 of them. Now, Paul is explaining you cannot be justified by God through any form of human merit, and you definitely can't through the law. Now, justified is a legal term. It means when you are declared innocent, it's the opposite of condemnation. You know, we've got some lawyers here, or maybe people that deal with the courts, all right? And just imagine with me when you're in the courtroom, you've seen the movies, you've watched the shows, when the person's there and, and they're about, the, the judge is about to declare what the verdict is. And you see the person, you know, if it's, if it's a, I don't know, like CSI or something, one of those kind of law shows, you see the zooming in, the person's sweating, and then it moves to the the family of the person, they're sweating, they don't know what the verdict's going to be, and the judge just puts down the gavel and says, not guilty. And it's like, ah. Oh. And then you're watching, you're thinking, oh, okay, that's good. Or if the person's guilty, you'll know, no, that's bad, right? So, you know, that, that, that's what justified is. When you're declared innocent, it's the opposite of condemnation. And Paul is saying here, no one can be justified except by Jesus Christ. The Jewish, Jewish Christians were saying, no, 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 you have to do more, got to do this, that, that. Paul said, no, there's no way. In other words, your relationship with God, my relationship with God, it can't be made right, we can't be accepted or received by Jesus by any form, any form 
of Jewish law, any form of human effort, if anyone tries to tell you or to tell me that to be made right with Jesus, aside from believing in Him, you have to do A, B, and C, and D, and you have to do this and do that, they are not preaching the gospel. They are preaching a false gospel. It's what it says in Galatians 1, 6, and 7. Now, here's the tricky thing. The tricky thing is that it's so easy to slip into legalism in some shape or form. I've done it many times. I know people around me have done it in youth group and in church, in life group. It's very easy for us to slip into legalism. But you know what we need to do, church? Just like Paul in Galatians 2.19, what we need to do is we need to die to the law and we need to die to any concept or idea of human merit to gain the acceptance of God. Does that make sense? We need to take that thing and we need to crush it because it is not of God. Some of you are thinking, why, why is this so important? Now, here's why it's important, all right? This is what Galatians alone says. When we are legalistic, when we slip into this thinking that somehow we need to do some sort of human effort to be received by God, this is what it does. It makes the grace of God void and undermines what Jesus has accomplished through his death. So you think about that word void. You know, when you have a warranty on something, you know, and for some reason you did the wrong thing and then they say, sorry, but you broke that, that's void, right? Or you, you take your check that someone's written for you, you take it to the bank and they say, no, sorry, that's void. In other words, it's cancelled because of some shape or reason. Now, when we actually believe in this legalism thinking about our relationship with God, it makes the grace of God void. It's, like, it's almost like it cancels out what Jesus has done. It says that when we believe in this, we actually desert Him who actually called us into the grace of Christ. It explains that we actually, uh, we make Jesus of no value to us when we believe this. That's some pretty strong language, isn't it? We fall from grace, Galatians 5 verse 4. This is pretty serious stuff. When we actually believe in this idea that we need to somehow add to the grace of Jesus to be received by Him, this is what we're actually communicating to God. This is what we're doing. Now, um, I doubt anyone here coming to church this morning thought, yep, I want to follow the Jewish law. Was anyone here? I'm just curious. Was anyone here that thought that this morning when they got up? I'm going to follow the Jewish law. Get circumcised, right? No. Okay. But I've got a feeling that maybe some of us here today have these kind of thoughts about legalism maybe slipping to our thinking in our relationship with Jesus. That maybe some of us think that our standing with God is dependent on our spiritual activity. That whether we've read enough Bible, whether we've done enough quiet time, whether we've prayed enough, whether we've gone enough to life group or some sort of discipleship group, maybe whether we've been holy enough to some sort of standard in our mind. My standing with God is dependent on that. I know I've, I've thought that before. And if that's you, then I want to encourage you that, hey, look, let's release that now because actually that's not the gospel. Your standing with Jesus is not dependent on spiritual activity. Do you hear that, church? Your standing with Jesus is not dependent on your spiritual activity. Wow. Now, I came across this uh, article, which was really interesting the other day, uh, and it, it's a very confronting title, but I'll explain. Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's danger! Exclamation mark. Five signs that you're legalistic and probably miserable <laughs> by Stephen Altrog. So, uh, yeah, once you get past the title, you go, oh, actually, there's some really good stuff you know, in this. So, so, as we're going through these five signs, I want to encourage you to think, you know, maybe this morning you woke up, maybe, oh, I'm not legalistic, we're talking about, no, no, no. And maybe you look at the five signs, oh, actually, I've done that. Okay, yep, I've done that. As I was going through, I thought, yep, I've done that too. This is not to legalistically make you think that you are legalistic. But this is perhaps to open up our thinking today that, okay, if I'm doing some of this stuff, maybe I need to come before Jesus and say, Jesus, set me free from this. Because 
as Christians, we walk around with shackles all the time. Shackles that Jesus came to free us from, but for some reason they're still hanging on to us. And they uh, squeeze out the grace of God. They, they, they cause us to not enjoy the fullness of His promise and what He's come to bring. So you ready for the five? Okay, here's number one. A legalistic person. And so this doesn't mean you are legalistic, but it means that maybe there's legalism, all right, that's going on there. Number one, a legalistic person is angry when others receive grace. So if you look at Matthew 20, Jesus talks about the parable of someone going out looking for workers for the field. And a bunch of people start working for the field, and they've been working for X amount of hours. Then he still needs more help as he goes out, and then he finds some people who, who work for the last hour. And so when it comes to payday, the boss pulls out the money, and he gives everyone the same amount of pay. And the people that have been there for longer say, hey, what's going on? Like, you know, we work longer than this guy. And if you do a bit of, you know, it's talking about how God wants to uh, reach out to, to the Gentiles, right? Uh, we, we, we worked harder than this guy. How come he's getting the same pay? And if you remember what the, uh, the, the boss says, the boss says, why are you upset? Can't I be gracious? Can't I be generous with what's mine? And then sometimes this can happen to us. We get upset when others receive grace. Here's another one. Uh, a legalistic person constantly evaluates whether they're getting a fair deal. So if you look at Luke 15, it's about the parable of the prodigal son. Do you remember what the older son says? In the middle of the party, and the dad has to go out and plead, beg the older son to come in and celebrate with them. I slaved for you all these years. I worked so hard for you. You never gave me a calf so I could celebrate with my friends. This son of yours, how dare you, almost, is what he's saying. And then sometimes we can slip into this. God, I've been serving you all these years. How come, I, how come I'm not getting the promotion that, that I want at, at work? How come I'm not getting the windfall of my investments? How come I'm not... Uh, you know, having a better relationship with my children? Or, or how come I'm not finding the spouse that I'm looking for? You know, like, God, I deserve it. And sometimes we can fall into that. Here's a third one. A legalistic person constantly compares themselves to others. Luke 18. Uh, this is about two different people that are praying at the temple. Do you remember this parable? The Pharisees there. Just imagine, I thank you, God, that I am not like him, the tax collector. I fast this many times, I pray this many times, I give tithes, and all this, I do this, I do that. I'm awesome, God, right? You know, thank you that I'm not like him. And that tax collector just beats his breast, doesn't even look up. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, who went home justified? You know, so sometimes when we're legalistic, we compare ourselves to others. Oh, I've been praying so much. Oh, how come they haven't been at the prayer meetings? How come they haven't been? And it's okay to show concern, but it's possibly judgmental sometimes. How come they haven't been at life group as regularly? How come they're still on Zoom? Okay, no, 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 if you're thinking this, okay, I'm, I'm not saying, <laughs> I just, right. <laughs> how, how come this? How come that? How come they don't know their Bible verse? You know, we, we can do that, hey? We can do that. I've done it before. How could they have done so much? You know, how could they have done this bad thing? It's very easy for us to get legalistic, compare ourselves to others. I'm not like them. A legalistic person sometimes lacks joy. Psalm 32, 1, blessed are those whose sins are forgiven. That's what David says. When we realize how much that God has done for us in the grace of Jesus, when we realize, or even for David, realizing the forgiveness of God for our sins and what we've done, there is a joy. But for the legalistic person, they miss out on that joy because for them, it's not about 
the forgiveness that God has given to them, but it's about the activity that they've done or whether they've earned enough of the grace of God. Have I done enough for him to forgive me? Have I done enough for him to be happy with me? And so oftentimes a legalistic person will not experience the joy of forgiveness and grace. Here's another one. And this one, I think, out of the one I've observed most in interactions with other believers, friends, etc. over the years, a legalistic person feels like God is never happy with them. Oh man, I'm just, I'm just such a sinner. Oh man, I'm just, I'm just so unspiritual. Oh man, I'm, I just, I look at other people in church, and I just don't have that level of ABC. You know, I just, I can't pray like such and such. You know, I just don't have the same intimacy as. You know, and just God, God just, He must look at me and He just must think that I'm not good enough. Just like my mum, just like my dad. This is, this is maybe how God feels about me. And so when they look at the face of God in their imagination, they see the scowling face of perhaps a parent in their life or a teacher in their life. And so. Sometimes the legalistic person is just overwhelmed by this feeling of never making the cut. And this is in the same article. I would encourage you to look it up, by the way. But this is what Spurgeon says. He says, The poor sinner trying to be saved by the law is like a blind horse going round and round a mill and never getting a step further, but only being whipped continually. Oh, Amen. The faster he goes, the more work he does, the more he is tired. Anyone felt like that before? <laughs> right? It is possible to experience Christian life like this. But is this what Jesus has for you and for me? <laughs> he didn't rescue you and me for us to experience misery. And actually... This is why the title of this, uh, of this article is Five Signs You're Legalistic and Probably Miserable because what Stephen says is that this is the most miserable sin. There is some sin that you, you do, you actually enjoy it. But this sin makes you even more miserable. So we need to be set free from this church of any form that it's popping up. The challenge for us is so much of life is based on effort. If I work harder, if I study harder, if I try harder, if I practice harder, if I please harder, then I'll succeed, I'll be accepted. Just praying this morning, you know, someone was praying and they were saying, God, deliver us from performance culture. Because so much of life is performance culture, isn't it? And sometimes social media doesn't help that. I mean, yes, we celebrate because someone just did that or just did that or accomplished this. Yes, that's great. But then that makes us go, I've got to do that too. And not only me, but my kids have got to do that too. And I look at other people. Have they done that? Have I done that? Have we somehow, you know, uh, met the cut of what society expects of us? And so we apply that to our Christian experience. We think, God, that's how God feels. Everything else in the world is like that, but no, that is not how grace, God feels. You know, some of us have parents like that. Some of us have friends like that, our spouses like that, that, that look at us and, and, and we're judged by whether we've hit the, the cut or not, but God is not like that. Praise God, God is not like that. Oh, praise God that He's not like that. Very little in life echoes grace, and grace is about the kindness of the giver, not about the performance of the receiver. Praise God. Imagine with me, I've shared a similar thing in the past about this, but imagine with me that you're a parent. And you come downstairs. So even if you're in Dig JC today, give me a wave, you're in Dig JC today. All right? Just say you're in Dig JC. Imagine this, okay? I know it's hard, but imagine you're a parent. You come downstairs, and you see your daughter, and she's cleaning the house. She's got the vacuum cleaner out you know, mopping the floor. And then you're saying, what are you doing? It's 6.30. You know, how come you're, you know, like 
what are you doing this for? And you, you look at her and there's a fear in her eyes. She's got this fear in her eyes. She's looking at you and she says, Mom, Dad, I, I just want to make sure you're happy. You know, I, I just, I just want to, I just want to make sure that 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 you, you you know that I love you and then you love me, right? You do, right? So with that fear in the eyes, and, and you look at her, you're like, "What's going on?" And then you move your way, confused, from that living area, and you find yourself in the kitchen, and there you see your son, and he's got his apron on little kind of chef's hat. And he's got this really smug look on his face. Hey, mom. Hey, dad. Bacon and eggs. Sunny side up. That's how you like it, right? Yeah? Yeah? Got a bit of eggs benedict on the side as well, you know, just in case you feel like something a bit different. On a brioche toast, right? Triple shot soy latte, extra hot. That's how you like it, right? Yeah. I've got the other one ready because I know that when you finish this one, you're going to be ready for the next one. Who's your favorite? Who's your favorite, huh? Who's your favorite? Now come sit down. I've prepared this meal for you. It's sumptuous. Come and enjoy it. You want some extra cranberry juice as well? I've got it ready. Now about that allowance and that PlayStation 5 I was talking about last week. How about it, huh? Now what are you going to say to your daughter, what are you going to say? You're going to say, come here. Put the vacuum cleaner down. <laughs> I love you. I love you so much. You know, of course I love you. It's I'm not going to love you less because you've got the vacuum cleaner in your hand or not. You're my daughter. Nothing is going to change that. Now come, give me a hug. What are you going to say to your son? <laughs> I just, I do need to apologize to Nathaniel here today. This is not about you, Nathaniel, all right? Okay, just in case you're wondering. I love you very much. All right, what are you going to say to your son? When I was writing this, <laughs> this is literally the words that came out of my mouth, and I, I literally just burst out laughing. Wipe that smug look off your face. <laughs> come here. Wipe that smug look off your face, but come here right now. I don't love you because you know my breakfast order and exactly how like, I like my coffee. I don't love you because, you know, you, you, you work extra hard to get all this stuff out right. I love you because I love you. I love you because you're my son. Nothing is going to change that. And please, again, wipe that smug look off your face because that's not going to earn uh, more acceptance from me. I love you anyway. Are you a bit like the daughter? You don't have to wave if you do, but maybe you're a bit like the daughter today. And there's a part of you which feels like your standing with God really is dependent on whether you're doing enough. Maybe there's even a bit of fear behind that. Today, if that's you, let that shake off you. Are you a bit like the sun? And maybe you're thinking, oh, dad's going to be proud of me because I've got all the stuff ready. I'm working hard. And again, shake that off. You are fully and completely loved in Jesus Christ. You know, to be honest, I've experienced both of these before. There are times that I stumbled in my sin. And like the daughter, I thought, is Jesus ever going to accept me again? Does he truly love me? I keep making the same mistake again and again and again. Is there really enough grace for me? And I think I've got to somehow make up for it. You've done that before? You stepped into sin, okay, I've got to make up for it now and somehow have a good run the next week, you know, a good run the next couple of weeks, do enough spiritual things, maybe with the vacuum, spiritual vacuum cleaner in my hand, Dad's going to smile on me again. You experienced that before, just let that shake off you. That's not the gospel. And I've flung on the other side before. When I have a good week of spiritual activity under my belt, 
or a good week of, you know, spiritual, you know, I've done the right thing for a couple weeks and, oh man, this is going good. Man, where's the gold stars, Jesus? <laughs> Just right here, there's a spot right on this little crab logo. I'm ready for it. Only to realize again, that's not the gospel. You've been there before? Yeah? Our loving Father sent Jesus, His Son, to give His life for you and for me. And He sent the Spirit to live in us, the basis of God's love and acceptance and forgiveness for you and for me is Jesus Christ. Oh, how good is God? How good is God? You know what? It would break the heart of God. It would absolutely break the heart of God if we think that we need to jump through hurdles or to do A to Z to be accepted by Him and to be made right with Him. It would break His heart, church. It would break His heart if we were stuck in this guilt-shame cycle of never knowing whether we've done enough for Jesus to forgive us or to receive His love. It would break His heart if we were in a pride, self-confidence cycle of thinking that we've done so much to be accepted by Him. It would break His heart if we slipped into some sort of a judgmental kind of culture where we're always uh, looking at other people and, and judging them, you know, have they done enough? Has he done enough? Has she done enough? You know, uh, have, have they uh, uh, met the kind of standards that I personally have as a believer? It would break His heart if we slipped into that judgmentalism. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not suggesting it's a bad thing to spur one another on to love and good deeds. That's a good thing to do that. What's not good is a culture of judgmentalism and condemnation. Right? It would break his heart if we had that. I want to ask a question today. Who believes in Jesus and what he's done for us through his death and resurrection? Give me a shout if you do. Yep, you believe in that today? You believe in that today? Awesome. Well, based on that, praise God. You are completely accepted by Jesus. 100% completely. Step into that freedom. The judge has proclaimed you are not guilty, you are innocent. Oh, wow, what a grace. Completely innocent. Let's step into that freedom. Yeah? Yeah? And when sometimes these thoughts come into our mind, these legalistic thoughts come into our mind, or someone comes along, or something happens that challenges that, they come to the judge and they say, Judge, you know, uh, Andy's guilty, Corey's guilty, Joshua's guilty, then what's the judge going to do? The judge is going to say, he's going to point to the cross. It's done. I've already declared innocent, not guilty, it's done. And they say, no, but, but this, but that, but that, look, look at his life, look at her life. No, it's done. Jesus done it. It's finished. It is complete. It is done. And in that beautiful reality that the penalty has been paid by Jesus for you and for me, we are completely free. Completely free in Christ. It's finished. We need to step into that freedom. And we need to try to uh, notice when the legalism tries to put its chains around us and to break them again and just entrust them to God, to not be yoked into them again. Anyone like maths here? Give me a wave if you like maths here today. Yep, there's a few people. Oh, Marina and Jess must run in the family. <laughs> Damn it. So I was going to ask if anyone has a tissue. I, I apologize. Uh, if someone does, I would, kind of, I would really appreciate that. All right. So those of you who like maths, oh, thank you so much. I know, I know. I just keep forgetting to put them in my pocket. Sorry. <laughs> if you like maths here today, here is a simple maths equation. The cross represents Jesus and what he's done through the cross, okay? We add our faith to what Jesus has done. Then we are justified. That is it. Don't add anything else to that equation, all right? 
Now, this is the challenge, you know, uh, because maybe we don't know our spiritual mass very well, but what's going to happen is things are going to sneak in and say, no, 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 you need to add a bit of this and add some of that and you need to add something else. Now, I've got a very simple solution for this. If those things come to try to add to the equation, remember this, it's really cheesy, but just cross it out, okay? Just cross it out. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Right. Cross out anything that would seek to add to the equation of being justified, being made right with Jesus, because this is all you need. Jesus and your faith in Him. That's it. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. That no one can say, oh, look, man, look at what I've done. I'm saved. It's because of me. No. It's the grace of God, what He has done, and it is faith in his grace, grace of Jesus. Praise God for that. And out of the overflow of that grace, how then should we live? This is the challenge, right? Because the people that were opposing Paul, they were basically saying, the, the Jewish Christians, mate, if you don't give them some sort of guide, they're just going to go crazy. They're going to live in sin. You're going to encourage them to sin. They're going to go nuts. These Gentiles, have you seen the stuff that they do? It's going to be bad, Right? Well, this is how. This is the alternative to legalism. The freedom of the Spirit. Oh, praise God for that. Okay, we're just going to fly through this, but verse, um, uh, what, verse 16, it says we've got to walk by the Spirit. So to walk by the Spirit, that's living by the moment-by-moment -moment direction, the constant guidance of the Spirit of God in our life. That's the alternative for us from legalism. And then, uh, just like you see in this kind of little image here, just imagine the Spirit is the one walking ahead of us, and we're just walking with the Spirit as He guides us. Verse 18, be led by the Spirit. Uh, again, just a very simple kind of concept, but as we are led by the Spirit, it's the same verb as a farmer leading cattle, herding cattle, shepherd leading sheep, a captain driving a ship, right? Uh, this image here of a locomotive pulling the carriage behind it. So the Holy Spirit is like this source of power and guidance. And what we do, we just keep being led by the Spirit in our lives. You know, the Holy Spirit, uh, we're encouraged to keep in step with the Spirit. Some people say it's like a dance. I know Susan likes dancing. Anyone else here likes dancing? Tina likes dancing. Hey, take her dancing, Ellen. Yeah? Okay, no, no, no. Some people say it's like a dance. Where... The kind of dance where there's someone guiding and the other one follows, right? And so the Spirit of God is, is leading us. We follow His movements. We keep in step with Him. So instead of focusing on getting everything right ourselves, God wants us to focus on following the Spirit. And as we follow the Spirit, walk with Him, be led by Him, keep in step with Him. So it's all about relationship here. As we do this, what's going to happen the Spirit of God is going to produce the fruit in our life. It's going to happen. Like a master gardener, walking through the garden of your heart and my heart and our mind and our relationships, he's going to walk through there and he's going to say, come on, Andy, let's have a look at the garden today. Okay, we need to sow some seeds there. Okay, Dan, we need to water this. <laughs> right? Yeah, Phil, we need to prune this plant here together. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm going to help you. I'm going to, let's, let's do this together. And as, as that happens, the fruit of the Spirit is going to grow in our life and legalism is going to fall off of us. The weeds of legalism are going to fall off of us. And we're going to walk in the freedom and the abundance of being children of God because that is who we are. Amen? And this is how the fruit is going to grow. Love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. Again, I just want to remind us that it's the fruit of the Spirit, right? It's not the fruit of our hard work or the fruit of our labor, the fruit of our discipline, the fruit of our spiritual activity. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the result of His presence, His activity in your life and in my life. And as we follow that, move with that, respond with that, the fruit is going to grow. And we just, me and Corey, we just want to highlight this. The last thing that we would want is as we go through each of the fruit of the Spirit in the coming weeks, for us to come here on a Sunday listen to the talk about love or about joy, and then go, go home and go, okay, I've got, to, I've got to grow love. Come on, Sam. Come on, Ed. Let's grow love. You know, I've got to grow joy. You know, what am I going to do to make it happen in my life? You know, that's the last thing we want. The first thing we want is 
for us to leave here and go, Holy Spirit, do it in me. I'm glad you're excited about that, Josh. But yeah, Holy Spirit, do this in me. Do it in me and do it with me. Show me what you want me to do. I want to move with you. You know, uh, you know lead me, Master Gardener. A few years ago, I had to get six teeth removed. Whoop, where are we? Okay, here we are. <laughs> Four wisdom teeth, and you're thinking, how do you get six wisdom teeth? No, it's because next to my wisdom teeth at the bottom, they were decaying. And so I had to get six, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six removed. I was under local anesthetic, so I was awake the whole time. The sound of grinding. Mm. Okay, I'll stop it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I didn't go into that, that dental appointment saying, I've got to, I'm, I'm going to get my teeth out. I went in there going, well, one, I need the grace of Jesus right now. <laughs> but two, I need to be as still and as compliant as possible. Because if I don't, this could be bad. And so there he is. He wasn't a very gentle man, but thankfully he wasn't an, an angry, aggressive man either. But, you know, I was just being as still as possible and just, okay, open your mouth wider. My mouth was open. <laughs> Move your tongue. Move my tongue, <laughs> right? Whatever it took so that we could work together for these teeth to be removed. Same thing again when I go to Sing Song Hair Salon in West Ryde <laughs> and I see Jenny, Jenny, how are you going? What would you like? Hey, let's do this together. Now, when I get my hair cut, I don't go into Sing Song saying, okay, Andy, you're going to cut your hair today, mate. You're going to do it. I go into that hairdresser going, I'm going to need someone to do this for me because I can't do this on my own. But when that hairdresser says, okay, can you tilt your head forward? I'm there. <laughs> when the hairdresser says, okay, head back, I'm there. Sometimes I'm preempting Jenny's movements and there's a slight touch. You know, I'm just, I'm just moving, right? <laughs> Wherever it goes, where, whatever it takes. Because this transformation... <laughs> needs both her guidance and skill and my cooperation. You see what I'm getting at? I think you do. When it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit growing this fruit in our life, think like this. And if dentist is going to freak you out, think of something else, okay? But this is what the Spirit wants to do. And the work that the Spirit wants to do in your life and my life is far more intimate, far more uh, an important kind of surgery than dental surgery or, or even than heart surgery. This is spiritual surgery going on. This is soul surgery. This is mind surgery. This is heart, our, our inner being surgery. And so why do we think that we need to do it on our own? I, why? <laughs> Why have I fallen into that trap so many times of thinking, oh yeah, I'll get my teeth done by someone else, I'll get my hair cut done by someone else, spiritual stuff, I've got this. That would have saved me so much heartache if I realized this earlier. If only I re realized earlier, I would have saved so much heartache and unnecessary pain. But I thank God that as more love, more joy, more peace more self-control began to grow in me by His grace, replacing the anger and sadness and anxiety and the giving into sin that I was struggling with. I thank God that He began to do this in me. And again, when people around you start seeing this fruit dripping from your life and my life, when they start tasting of it, when they start smelling it, when they, when they experience the love overflowing and the joy radiating and the peace kind of exuding, from your life and my life, when they taste of the patience and the kindness and the goodness, just in you and in you, Justin, they will see the finger of God. When they, when they experience uh, the, the faithfulness, they will see the kingdom of God at work, the finger of God at work in your life and my life. You will look different. We're going to sound different. We're going to smell different. And so remember this. Just remember this. Remember to tell them where you got your hair cut. 
you, you get what I'm saying? Remember to tell them who transformed your soul and your heart. Remember to tell them about the Jesus spiritual salon that you've been going to and the way that he's been working in your life and my life so that he might be glorified. Okay, here's the soul training for this week, guys. Thankfully, it's before the fast that's starting Monday next week, all right? I'm calling it fruit time. I want to encourage you, consult with your doctors if you've got high sugar levels, by the way. All right, so I want to encourage you to eat a piece of fruit this week. And as you do that, maybe have an extended time of grace while holding that piece of fruit. Don't worry, even if you're at the office or at school, you're holding that apple and you're looking at it. You know, if someone says, what are you doing? Say, I'm praying, right? Thank Jesus for loving and accepting and justifying you. Thank him for that. Thank you for that, especially if you've noticed some of the legalism stuff before and, you know, you experienced that. Just hold on to that fruit and just thank him in your heart. Say, praise you, Jesus, that you've accepted me and it's all because of your grace. And the next thing I want to encourage you to do is to invite the Spirit to grow that fruit in your life. If it's a particular aspect of that fruit, pray for that. If you've been longing for more peace or more joy or more love, pray specifically for that. If you're needing more soul control, pray specifically for that. Or if you just open-hearted, Spirit of God, anything you want to do in me, grow all the fruit that is in your heart to grow. Do it in my life. Does that sound good, church? Can we do this? All right, why don't we... Uh, I'm just going to invite Jess to come and lead us in this song right now. Again, just a reminder that we can't physically sing, but I would encourage you to perhaps, perhaps this time just stay seated and allow the words of this song to just wash over your heart. And as these song words are washing over your heart, may the reality of what Jesus has done just overflow us in a fresh way today. And may the, uh, 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 what's, what's the best way to say this? May, may any shackles of legalism that we might be experiencing inside of us, just release them to Jesus right now and let that fall right off us. And after that, Corey will lead us in communion as we close our service today.